Oh, hey Bio20s, I'm back again for another lesson. Today we're going to be discussing aquatic ecosystems, so factors that affect aquatic ecosystems and how aquatic ecosystems can change over time. So, first thing you gotta know about aquatic ecosystems is there can be terrestrial, or sorry, there can be terrestrial biomes, right? We talked about the different types of terrestrial biomes. We talked about um, ecosystems within the terrestrial biomes, and the same thing can be said for aquatic ecosystems. So there's kind of two main aquatic biomes. There's the saltwater marine biome and the freshwater um, biome as well. Within these biomes, we can then have different ecosystems. So for example, a lake ecosystem. We can divide a lake ecosystem into three specific zones. We can have the littoral zone, which essentially will extend from the shoreline to the point where you will no longer find rooted plants. This is the most productive area of the lake mainly because there's still some good soil, good amount of sunlight, good nutrients. So this would be the most productive part of the lake, which would be the littoral zone. Then we move further out to the limnetic zone. The limnetic zone, photosynthesis would still occur. There would still be light penetration. However, there would no longer be rooted plants, but you still might find some photosynthetic organisms like plankton. Um, you would also find other type of organisms that feed on this plankton within this area here, which is the limnetic zone. And then up until this line here, this is where light would penetrate and eventually it would stop. We reach our profundal zone. So light cannot enter into the profundal zone. It's too deep. We generally find nutrients, decomposers down here, dead plants, dead animals that have fallen to the bottom of the lake. Um, oxygen levels tend to be very, very low because the decomposers are using all of the oxygen to break all of that stuff down. So there's not a lot going on at the bottom of the lake in terms of uh, producers and consumers. Mostly it's just decomposers breaking things down. Now, factors that affect aquatic ecosystems. Number one, it would be your chemical environment, which would be the type of water, dissolved oxygen, whether it's salt water, fresh water. So some organisms are, of course, adapted to fresh water. Some are adapted to salt water. You can't really switch those two up. Of course, dissolved oxygen is essential in aquatic ecosystems. Terrestrial ecosystems, you don't really have to worry about it because you just breathe in air. It's not really an issue. For aquatic ecosystems, you're looking at, well, if there's not enough oxygen dissolved in the water, where are you going to get your oxygen from? So you need to make sure that the amount of dissolved oxygen is appropriate for the species that you have there. Also, temperature and sunlight can impact the amount of dissolved oxygen you have. Also, temperature and sunlight can affect the water density. You'll notice here, as the temperature of water increases, its density decreases. So water does this weird thing. At about four degrees Celsius, water is its most, is its densest point. After four degrees, you go to three, two, one, zero, and then water drops in density. The reason for that is it's now starting to freeze into ice. And when we get to sub-zero uh, sub temperatures, ice is then less dense than water. This is why ice is on top, right? Or ice floats in our drinks. So water is at its most dense at four degrees Celsius, which is a value you should know. When it moves past four degrees Celsius, it actually gets less dense. And as it moves past four degrees Celsius this way, it also gets less dense. Then if we look at our dissolved oxygen content or just dissolved gases in general, as the water temperature increases, the amount of dissolved oxygen decreases. So if you've ever had a pop or anything carbonated and you've left it out and it's gotten warm, basically that CO2 dissolved in there will now no longer be dissolved in the solution and it will escape, so it's gone flat. So you wanna keep your carbonated beverages at a cold temperature to make sure that gas stays dissolved in water. So essentially colder water holds on to dissolved gas a lot easier, such as dissolved oxygen. So we need to remember these two key points as we go through the seasonal change or seasonal variation within lakes. Number one, four degrees Celsius is the densest um, water will be. Number two, solubility of gas within a liquid, within water. So the solubility of oxygen decreases as the temperature increases. So let's chat a little bit about the seasonal variation of lakes, okay? So this would be anywhere that has four seasons, right? So here in Canada, we do have four seasons. So let's start in winter. 
During winter, we have distinct layers forming. There's not a lot of movement in terms of thermal movement or thermal regulation in terms of heat. We have our top layer, right? We have the top layer of ice. This would be the um, less dense layer of ice. It's floating on top of the water. We then have our epilimian, thermocline, and hypolimian. So epilimian being the warmer water, thermocline being the separation between the warmer epilimian and the colder hypolimian at the bottom. So the thermocline will separate that. Since there's a temperature separation, you're not going to get very much water movement during the winter months. You're also not gonna get a lot of oxygen movement during the winter months. Now, as we move from winter to spring, something very interesting happens, okay? This top layer right here, ice, warms up to four degrees Celsius. And what happens when it warms up to four degrees Celsius, it now becomes denser than the water below it. So it falls to the bottom of the lake pushing the water at the bottom of the lake to the top, and we call this spring turnover. And spring turnover will recycle dissolved O2. So now dissolved O2 is gonna cycle through the lake thanks to this turnover process. As that top layer, we're gonna move from spring to summer now, as that top layer continues to warm past four degrees Celsius, we're going to have our layers form again. So now the warmer epilimian, thermocline and then colder hypolimian. And then during the summer, you won't have very much movement. So there won't be very much movement within the summer because we have our thermal layers established. Maybe a little bit of movement in the epilimian because of wind, but nothing like you see in the spring or fall turnover. Then as we go from summer to fall, the temperature of the epilimian will drop to four degrees Celsius making it once again denser than the bottom. We have another round of turnover where that denser top water falls to the bottom, cycling oxygen, allowing oxygen to cycle through the lake. Then as that top layer continues to cool to below freezing, we move back up to winter where we have ice and our thermal layers forming. So we're cycling through these seasonal variations within our lakes. Now, how can aquatic ecosystems change over time? Well, as lakes change, the amount of the different types of species we found in the lakes will change as well. So for example, a lake will evolve generally from a ligotrophic lake, which is a deep, cold lake, um, full of oxygen, low nutrients though, to a eutrophic lake, which is a shallow, warm lake, high nutrients, but low dissolved oxygen levels. And here's how this process works. It's called eutrophication. So over time, right, sediment will continue to build up in the bottom of the lake, um, which will then make it, <clears throat> excuse me, which will then affect its depth, right? So this lake obviously being much deeper than this lake. Over time, temperature can change as well. Nutrient levels can change as well. So if we have phosphorus or nitrogen that run off from fertilizers, this can speed up the process of eutrophication, leading to algal blooms, leading to the changing from an oligotrophic lake to a eutrophic lake. And over time, this process can take a once deep cold lake into a shallow warm lake. Now, when we look at these lakes, right, um, a oligotrophic lake would be deep, cold, and since it's cold, it can hold a lot of dissolved oxygen. We might find things like trout and catfish and loons. And then we go to a eutrophic lake, much less dissolved oxygen, more sunlight, warmer temperatures, and now we're having things like frogs and turtles and ducks, still catfish though, those two, that species will be able to survive oligotrophic or eutrophic. But we notice how the species change as the lake ecosystem changes. Also, water pollution can impact lakes. So there are five categories of water pollution. There's solid organic waste, which is sewage and other waste saved from food processing. There's disease causing organisms like microbes from sewage or other types of animal waste. There's inorganic solids and dissolved minerals, so fertilizers, salt from roads. There's thermal waste, so electricity plants and other industries will change the heat or the temperature of the lake. There's organic compounds like oil from roads, pesticides or detergent. All of these different things can pollute a lake and change it over time and change the species found there. Now, to end here, what are some indicators that you have good water quality? 
Well, you can test for bacteria, right? You can see, okay, if there's bacteria in a lake, maybe the water quality isn't so good. However, this test tends to be expensive and most of the time it's ineffective. However, it is good to test for bacteria. For example, if you know you have coliform bacteria from the intestines of animals, this can, I'm showing up in the animal waste, this can make a lot of people very, very sick, and all species very, very sick if they ingest this. You can test the dissolved oxygen, right? If you have good dissolved oxygen, you're gonna support a lot of good organisms. If you don't have good dissolved oxygen, you might not support a ton of organisms. Um, even if you don't test for dissolved oxygen, you can even look at indicator species. If you have healthy trout, generally that means you have good oxygen. You tend to have more carp and catfish. You tend to have lower dissolved oxygen. And then finally, you can test for something called BOD, which stands for biological oxygen demand. So as the organic matter increases, right? So plant matter, decaying matter, things like that, the BOD will increase because the decomposers will need more oxygen to decompose all that organic matter, which in turn will lower your dissolved oxygen. So a higher BOD would relate to a lower dissolved oxygen. A lower BOD would relate to a higher dissolved oxygen. So that's all I have for you today. Next lesson, we're gonna jump ahead to chapter five and talk about evolution. So we're gonna go through some evidence of evolution and how the theory of evolution was put together. So thanks again for watching, and we'll chat soon.